Hey guys, welcome back to How to Roll Dice. I'm Josh, and today we're going to be doing a review and walkthrough of this game here, Gravwell Escape from the Ninth Dimension by Renegade Game Studios. Gravwell is a game for two to four players that sees those players taking on the role of spaceships attempting to escape the gravitational forces of a black hole that they've just traveled through. Upon coming out the other side, they realize they are slowly being sucked back in, which will cause them to be smashed into atomic dust, and so they're going to attempt to mine various asteroids and other celestial objects that are orbiting around the black hole in an effort to gain enough fuel to thrust themselves out of the gravity well of the black hole and towards the warp gate. The warp gate is sort of the home safe location that each player is trying to make it to. Uh, only one player is going to make it though, because the first player into the warp gate wins and all other players are sucked back into the singularity and turned into nothingness. Uh, this is a fun game because it utilizes just enough randomness that it stays a bit silly, even though you can be strategic about how you play it. Um, it's somewhere on the level of like blackjack, where even if you can uh, you know, obtain the ability or, or practice enough to count the cards and know exactly what's left in the deck and, you know, factor in the strategic or the statistical probability that any specific combination of cards is going to come up at any given time, you can only take that so far. I think in Blackjack you have like a 47% chance of beating the house ever, even if you're counting cards, so you're not really in the... the, the you're not going to win the majority of times. Um, this is a game like that, although with a lot more silliness and obviously a sci-fi theme thrown into it. So looking at what comes in the box before we get further into how the game works, uh, there isn't a lot. It's not a component-dense game. Uh, this is a pretty cheap game. It's only about $35, which in the realm of games is pretty much on the low end of medium as far as price goes. Um, it's not a small box game, so it's not something you're going to be able to fit into your pocket or play on a park bench, but it's not a huge game like Eclipse or Scythe or something that's going to fill up an entire dining room table plus. Uh, so it's right in that sweet spot in the middle there. So looking at what comes in the box, you've got the fuel cards over here. This is a deck of 26 cards broken down into three separate colors, yellow, blue, and purple. These represent the different types of fuel that you can utilize during the game to move your ship away from the black hole, or in some cases, towards the black hole, which is going to happen more often than you think. I'll get into that when the actual gameplay methods come when we come to that point. Um, but these are broken down into three different colors. Then you have the actual emergency stop cards that players can use. When things are about to go super sideways and you realize you're really about to screw yourself with your next play, you can basically cancel it using an emergency stop card. Four of those colored to match the player ships, so red, yellow, black, and blue. Then we have the board itself. The board is a spiral of hex spaces that are denoted in sets of five. So we've got five, 10, 15, 20, just to make placement easy and sort of quick counting a little simpler. Um, in the center of the board, you have the singularity. That's the black hole that you just emerged from that you're trying to escape the gravity of. All of your player ships are gonna start there. And then at the end of the spiral of hex spaces, you have the warp gate. That's actually space number 55. So there are 55 spaces that you need to traverse in order to win the game. Uh, you also have these two yellow hexes marked here. These are going to be the locations of the two derelict ships that players do not control, but they do interact with quite a bit. I'll get into those in a minute. Uh, you've got these two charts in the corners here, these sort of bar graphs. Those are identical and those are player aids. I'll touch on those. And then lastly, you have this round tracker right here in the corner because the game has a hard stop after six rounds, even if nobody has won. So it keeps the game to a tight 30 to 45 minutes, which is, again, a great little sort of mid section as far as game length goes. It's not 10 to 15, it's not three or four hours. It's something you could play as an opener. It's something you could play just off the cuff if you have enough people and you feel like playing something. It's a great game for introducing people into games like this or more advanced games beyond your typical Milton Bradley Hasbro type stuff because it adds in some more complex mechanics, but nothing that people won't be able to pick up on the fly. I'm getting ahead of myself, but that's the board. You've got the ship uh, miniatures or ship tokens here. They're basically little ship miniatures on flight stands. Four of them are for players, again, colored black, blue, red, and yellow. And then you have these two gray derelict ships that again, nobody controls, but you will be interacting with quite a bit. You've got this round marker here. That's for using on the little round spaces to track the current round. Again, game ends after six automatically, even if nobody has one. And you've got the rule book. The rule book is short and sweet. It's easy to get through. It's well laid out. I don't really have any issues with it. It even has some variant gameplays and a solo mode in there if you want to go for it. So getting into setting up the game and then into the actual gameplay itself, you're going to start by having each player choose one of the player ships and they're going to take the matching emergency stop colored card to go with it. Again, two to four player game unless you're playing the modified um, solo mode. 
Then you're going to take the two gray derelict ships and you're going to place them on the yellow hexes on the spiral. That's where they always begin. You're going to place the round counter on the round one space because that's generally where most games begin. And you're going to shuffle the fuel card deck. Now the fuel card deck has exactly 26 cards in it and that is because each card correlates to a letter of the English alphabet, A to Z. They're also denoted with different um, elements. I'm not sure if they're 100% real elements, but for example, radium and uranium I know are real. I don't know if jodium is true. Uh, if there happens to be an element for every letter of the alphabet, I'm sure they chose to go with that. Uh, and then uh, getting onto the cards a little bit uh, more in detail, what you're going to see on them besides the color and the elemental name, of which really only the first letter matters because we'll get into that in a minute, but basically one for each letter of the alphabet. So radium is R, uh, uranium is U, jodium is J. I'm sure there's some more, slightly more awkward ones because I know some elements don't necessarily have a letter abbreviation that matches their spelling. Um, again, didn't take chemistry, but for those of you that did, I'm sure I'm making a mockery of it. Uh, so you're going to take the 26 fuel cards and shuffle them, and then you're going to deal out the mining stacks. This is the first phase of every round. You have a mining phase, and then you have sort of your action movement phase. So the mining phase is where you're going to create stacks of cards. The number of stacks that you create is equal to the number of players times three. So three stacks per player. If you're playing a three player game, there'll be nine stacks. What is a stack? You're going to deal out a face down card with a face up card on top of it. That's a stack. So two cards, one face down, one face up. So all players will only be aware of 50% of any given stacks sort of make up the card that's face up on top. So you lay out your stacks, three for each player, and then you're going to begin picking and drawing stacks going around the table, starting with the player who is the youngest. Now that only counts for the first round. After that, it's going to be based off of where your ships are laid out on the spiral, but I'll get into that in a minute. So setting up your stacks, your mining stacks, and then starting with the youngest player and going clockwise, each player is going to choose one stack. So two cards, one face up and one face down. Obviously, you're only going to be able to make your decision based off the one that you can see. So once you've drawn all of your stacks, which you're going to go around the table repeatedly until each player has drawn three, you're going to have a total of six cards. 50% of the cards that you just drew will be a complete surprise to you because you didn't know what you were going to get because they were face down. So now you're done the mining phase pretty quick. Then you're going to move on to the actual sort of action phase, which is where you're going to be playing cards. Each player is going to look at their hand of six cards and they're going to choose one to put face down in front of them. Once all players have done that, so again, three player game, you got three different players doing this, it's pretty fast. Once all players have done that, you're all simultaneously going to flip the card and reveal what you played. Then activate your cards or utilize your fuel cards in alphabetical order. That's why each card is based off of one letter of the English alphabet, A to Z, total of 26 cards. Now, other than the color of the card, you're also going to have, and the elemental name, which is the alphabetical order sort of signifier. Other than the color of the card, and I'll get into what those mean in a moment, you're also going to see a number in the upper left corner. That is how far that card is going to move you, or move your ship, I should say, or move other ships, depending on if it's a tractor beam card. Uh, so what you play during this phase is sort of getting back to uh, the randomness that I mentioned. That's sort of, if you wanna try to count cards, if you wanna try to keep in mind every card that's been played so far in a round, what you saw other players draw, you can try to keep all of that in your head and strategize and play the statistics of it. But you can also just play a card and hope it works out. And I feel like if you try too much to do the strategy thing and the analytical thinking thing, you can kind of drive yourself crazy in this game because a lot is going to happen that you have no control over because of the randomization of getting 50% of your cards without knowing what they're going to be, and then also not knowing in what order players are going to actually resolve their fuel cards because of the alphabetical order scenario. Unless, of course, you're playing a card that starts with A or a card that starts with Z, uh, you know, it's, it's difficult to tell what's going to happen. So everybody reveals their card, you then resolve them in alphabetical order. Let's get into what the colors of the cards mean because there are three different types of movement in this game. The primary type of movement, the standard fuel card, is yellow. Out of the 26 cards, 20 of them are yellow. And all that means is that you're going to move towards the nearest ship to you, the number of spaces shown on the card. So if, for example, you play a card that has a five on it, you're going to look at the board and you're going to say, okay, what ship is closer to me? The ship ahead of me or the ship behind me? If the ship is adjacent to you, obviously it's as close as can be, um, but otherwise you're usually just gonna count out. So, oh, this one ahead of me of two spaces out, this one behind me is three spaces out. So I'm gonna move ahead, I'm gonna move forward, which is good. You wanna move forward and away from the singularity. 
towards the warp gate. So you would move in that direction five spaces. If you pass over ships, whether they be player ships or derelict ships, you're just going to count the space anyways and keep moving. Uh, if you land on a ship with your final movement, so say you're moving five and on the fifth you land on a space that already has a ship, again whether it's a player ship or a derelict ship, you're just going to push yourself one space further in the direction that you were already moving. So if you were moving backwards, you go one space further backwards. If you were moving forward, one space further forwards. If you happen to land on the tail ship of say a series of three adjacent ships, basically you just keep hopping forward until you hit an empty space where you can stop forward or backwards again, depending on the direction that you were moving. You just keep moving in that direction. So that's your standard movement. It's towards the ship nearest your current location, whether it's ahead or behind, and the number of spaces shown on the card. Now, what if there is a tie? Say the ship ahead of you and the ship behind, of you, behind you are each two spaces away. Will you then break into, okay, in which direction are there more ships? Again, always counting the derelict ships, whether it be for the closest or just total number. Uh, they count just the same as player ships do when calculating which direction you're gonna move. So if there's a ship two spaces ahead of you and there's also a ship two spaces behind you, you then go, okay, how many ships total are there behind me and how many ships total are there ahead of me? Say for example, you have three behind you and two ahead of you, you're gonna move backwards. That's the tiebreaker for if the nearest ships are equidistant from you. What if you have a second tiebreaker necessary? Say for example, you have the same number of ships uh, or the ships the same distance ahead and the nearest ship the same distance behind. So two spaces in one direction, two spaces in the other direction, and an equal number of ships. So you have three ships ahead of you and three ships behind you. You don't move, you stay in place. And that's for a standard fuel card. Now moving on to the second most popular card of which there are only four in the entire deck, you have purple cards. Those are repulsion cards. They basically work exactly the same as standard cards, except instead of moving towards the nearest ship, you're going to move away from the nearest ship the number of spaces shown, and the same tiebreakers apply. If the ships are equidistant to you, calculate whichever section has the largest number of ships total and move away from that direction. And if it's a perfect tie, meaning the ships nearest to you are equidistant and you have an equal number of ships on either side of you, you just stay put. The last type of card is the blue card. This is the rarest card, there are only two of them, and this is the tractor beam card. When you play this card, you are not going to move. Instead, you are going to move every other ship, player and derelict ships, towards you the number of spaces shown on the card. Now, because you're moving other ships, there needs to be a specific order to this. And the order that's defined is you move ships that are nearest to you first and then move out from there. So you move the nearest ship to you, then you move the second nearest ship to you, then the third nearest ship, and you go out from there. Players are gonna go around the table simultaneously playing and then revealing a card, resolving their cards in alphabetical order, and then playing the next card from their hand. So now you have five, choose a card, face down. Once everybody has a face down card, flip it. Resolve in alphabetical order. Okay, now you've got four, face down. Everybody's got a card. Okay, flip it. Resolve in alphabetical order. This goes on until there are all the cards are played. Nobody has any cards left in their hands. So six plays, six turns. After that, you start a whole new round. You slide your round marker over one, you gather up all the cards, you shuffle them together, and you deal a new set of mining stacks, three per player. This time, instead of beginning with the youngest player and moving clockwise around the table for drawing stacks, you're going to go from the farthest player, or the farthest back ship, so the ship closest to the singularity, and then work your way forward. So it's likely not even going to be in, alpha, um, in clockwise or counterclockwise order, it's gonna be random. It's gonna be you, and then me, and then them, and then them, and you're just gonna go like that. So it's based off of whoever's farthest back, and then moving your way forward. That's the order in which you're going to choose your stack. So it kind of balances the fact that you're in the rear, you get a better chance of playing catch up. There is a bit of an interesting mechanic in the way that this works, because obviously you're using this kind of slingshot method, right? You're picking the nearest ship, you're grabbing them, and you're pulling yourself in that direction. And you wanna hope that you don't accidentally pull yourself backwards. Um, if you do, that's kind of a benefit. It's bad because you wanna be the frontmost ship because you wanna make it the warp gate first, but at the same time, if you're all the way at the back, especially if you're all the way back at the singularity and you sling yourself all the way back to the starting point, which doesn't kill you or anything, it just means you can't go back anymore, well, that's exactly what it means. You can't go backwards anymore. You can only go up from here or you can only go forward from here. So you might as well just try to draft or, or play or pull the biggest numbers that you can see in the stack for standard cards, yellow cards. And then no matter what order you end up sort of calculating movement in, you're going to move forward because you can't move backwards. So if you're all the way in the back, there's almost nothing to lose. There's no risk. Just play the largest numbers you can. Play a 10, play, a, play an eight. Just sling yourself forward as hard as you can. There's no risk. 
or there's there's very little risk. If you're in the singularity, there's no risk. If you're just outside the singularity, there's a small number of risk, small small bit of risk, because technically somebody could end up behind you, but that's unlikely. So, um, and then inversely of that, if you find yourself all the way at the front of the pack, you might think, oh, perfect, I'm in the lead, I'm doing great. But then you realize, wait a minute, standard fuel cards don't work for me anymore because they pull me towards the nearest ship and there are no ships ahead of me because I'm in the front. So standard fuel cards, 20 out of the 26 cards, all now pull me backwards. I can only use repulsion cards, purple cards, of which there are only four, to push myself forward off of the nearest ship behind me. And what's usually going to happen is, if you didn't plan correctly and draw at least one face-up repulsion card or happen to get one by luck from a face-down card, you're going to only have standard fuel cards remaining. So you end up playing these like small, you know, the smallest numbers that you can in hopes to not completely undo all of the effort, the progress that you just made, and hope that a ship eventually gets ahead of you and then you can slingshot off of that ship. Uh, the, the way the ships move around the board, you also kind of see this almost inchworm style movement. I don't know if you guys know what an inchworm is, but if you picture a little caterpillar, it kind of scrunches itself up in the middle and then stretches back out and scrunches itself up in the middle and stretches back out. And it, so it makes tiny progress by doing that in, in one direction. The ships kind of move like that. And it's interesting because it almost simulates the way that gravity works, where if you, you know, have two gravitational objects and you push them apart, they'll come back together eventually. But if they're moving forward while doing that, you have this kind of like forward moving slinky effect. And you actually see that with the ships throughout the course of the game. I've played this at least, uh, I don't know, nine or 10 times. And that always happens. <laughs> you have everybody starting at the singularity. Everybody shoots out of the singularity and scatters out. You're gonna have ships two, three, maybe even four hexes apart spread all across the spiral. And then over the next round, they'll all end up collapsing down on each other again because players that are in the front end up getting sucked backwards and players that are in the back get sucked forwards and the players in the middle get all scrambled around. And so this very large spread out group of ships, even with the derelict ships, all end up almost adjacent to each other. And then on the next round, they'll all spread out again and they'll start to spiral forwards a bit, but then they'll all sort of recollapse back in on each other just because of the way that cards work themselves out. And then they'll spread out again. And so you, you notice that pattern when you play the game and it's interesting because I feel like that simulates the functionality of how gravity would kind of work in the situation a little bit. Uh, not that I'm a physicist or anything, but it seems like that's kind of what it's emulating, whether it's intentional or by accident, uh, it's pretty cool. So it's a pretty straightforward game. You set up your mining cards, you draw your mining cards at first based on youngest player and clockwise. After the first round, it's based off of farthest back ship and then you go forward and that's the, the draw order. You play one card at a time, revealing them simultaneously. You resolve them in alphabetical order. Yellow cards move you towards the nearest ship. Purple cards move you away from the nearest ship. Blue cards move all the ships towards you, starting with the nearest ship to you and moving to the most distant ship to you or from you. Um, and then once you're done with all of that, you mine again, that starts the next round. You get a total of six rounds for somebody to try to make it to the warp gate. First player to make it to the warp gate wins. All other players lose the game or whoever is the frontmost ship when you reach the end of round six is the winner. That's the whole game. There are a couple of variant ways to play the game, but I feel like the way it's set up initially is pretty solid. I like the sort of randomness, silliness to the way that people are slingshotting back and forth with only a, a bit of a plan that generally falls apart pretty quickly. It can be frustrating for some. I've had at least one game of this where one player got very annoyed by the fact that no matter how hard they tried to get to the front and stay there, something always happened that yanked them back in. Um, and they just, I think there was one point where they were all the way in the front and then they ended around all the way in the back and they just couldn't deal with it and they just kind of walked away from the table. But for the most part, as long as you're expecting that to happen going in, you'll be fine. Um, so let's go over a proper rating for this game. First off, theme and immersion. I'm gonna give it a one. I feel like you can't really be fully immersive. I mean, maybe you can, but I feel like it's difficult to be fully immersive with such a quick, small game. I mean, this is a 30 to 45 minute game. It costs $35. It's not a huge box. It's not, it's, there's not flavor text on the cards. There isn't a huge backstory. There aren't characters. Um, there's just not enough to it to fully suck you in. But like I said, there are some features where, you know, the, the way the ship spread out and recollapse and the way you can sort of see one player scramble all the way to the front and then just, no, 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 and get sucked all the way back to the back of the row or back into the middle, sort of the maelstrom of ships switching around their positions. That kind of emulates the way that this would be going on in real life, but I don't get a lot of players speaking in their captain's voice or, you know, pretending to talk over comms or, you know, thrusters to full, anything like that. For the most part, you're just kind of trying to play the strategy of the game and having a good laugh when you see people's plans or even your own plans fall apart. So I'm gonna give it a one on theme and immersion. Uh, moving on to cost versus quality. 
I think this is a perfectly fine setup for $35 worth of game. I don't have much to complain about. I think it's got a lot of replayability to it because it's so quick and it's easy to learn and it's fun to get through as long as you don't have anybody that's going to get frustrated by the gameplay. Um, so I feel like the fact that it's it's only 35 bucks, it's quick to play, you can fit two or three games in on a whim, uh, and for the most part everybody's going to have a good time with it. It doesn't take a lot of like brain math. Uh, it's, it's solid, it's fairly priced. So a two for uh, cost versus quality. Moving on to ease of use, very easy to play game as far as physically setting up and manipulating. Small board, few number of pieces, small deck of cards. Every player gets their one e-stop card. Oh, did I forget to mention how the e-stop cards work? I think I did. If on your turn you reveal your card and then you look at the activation order alphabetically and you go, oh no, this is gonna slingshot me backwards like eight spaces. You can just flip your emergency stop card over and that doesn't happen. It just cancels that play. You get to use one e-stop per round. So every set of six cards, you're going to get to use your e-stop once and that's it. So um, ease of use, Easy use is easily a two. Um, there's, you can sit at a kitchenette table. I mean, a two and a half foot by two and a half foot table you could play this game on. It does not take a lot of room. There's not a lot to move around. There's not a lot of tokens to deal with. And oh, can you draw me, draw me two cards from that deck? I can't reach it. Okay, discard that. Can I get two of the glass beads over there? There's none of that going on. Everybody can just sit around the table and work with it. So very straightforward there. Solid two. Moving on to, is the game enjoyable? I'm gonna give it a one. I wanna give it a two, but I fully realize that this will frustrate very badly some people. Um, I think there's a lot more strategy to it than some people give it credit. It's not just a zany, I'm gonna play this card and oh no, let's see what happens. There is strategy to it, but it requires you to do some, so do a lot of focus and a lot of paying attention and some calculation in your head and keeping track of, okay, there's four, Repulsor cards, I drew one, I think I saw them draw one, I don't know if I saw the other two, I know I don't have one, so one of them three has it, one has already been played, I still have the other one in my hand, it means there's two floating around out there. Like, there's a lot of, you don't have to do that, if you want to, you can, but for the most part, if you're just gonna throw cards out there, you're still gonna have a good time. I just, I understand that some people are gonna get annoyed by the fact that you can't fully plan. You can only make so much of a strategy and then the randomization of drawing 50% of your cards face down and not knowing the alphabetical order in which things are going to pan out every turn may frustrate some people. Um, so I'm gonna give it a one for enjoyable, even though I personally think it's a two um, for me. <laughs> for everyone, I have to give it a one. Um, and then teachable, very teachable, very easy game to teach, to, to get people to wrap their heads around the concept of, because it's it doesn't have a lot of moving parts to it. It really only has three types of cards. The fact that the number and the alphabetical order of the cards changes doesn't really change your comprehension level of how things work at a base level. Um, and just looking at the board and examining, okay, well, I have a card that starts with the letter B, so I'm likely going to be playing, you know, I'm activating first, most likely. Um, and then I, you know, making sure that I'm closer to the ship ahead of me than I am the ship behind me, and I'm going to move three spaces in that direction. Boom. Um, it's only when you start to get into the crazier plays, like, all right, I'm going to use a tractor beam this turn, and the next turn I'm going to use a card that moves me nine. You know, you really have to start paying attention to what might come out when you're going to activate in the turn order, that kind of thing. But for the most part, learning the basics of the game, very straightforward, very easy to get through. And you could do a learner game and a follow-up game inside of an hour if you kept things moving. So that's pretty solid. So looking back at the actual scores for Theme and Immersion, we've got a one, just there's not enough here to fully suck you in. Um, looking at cost versus quality, I think it's totally fair. So a two there. As far as ease of use, solid two, very easy to manipulate and interact with the game. Small game, you know, you can play it on a small table. Everybody can reach everything. Looking at whether or not the game is enjoyable, I think it's a one just because some people will find the mechanics of it frustrating. And then looking at whether or not it's teachable, definitely teachable, so a two there. So overall, this game gets an eight out of 10. I would definitely recommend you give it a try. I would recommend you pick it up as long as you factor in that it might not be some people's cup of tea. Um, but for the most part, if your friends are into the fact that things might go a little silly, uh, then I think you're gonna have a lot of fun with this game. And I would def definitely recommend giving it a try uh, and picking it up. So, I hope you guys have enjoyed this review of Gravwell. If you have an opportunity to, please go down and subscribe and set your notification bell to all. Uh, make sure that you leave a like or a dislike so that I know whether or not I'm doing a good job here. And if you want to, leave a comment down below, whether it be about this video or just something in general. I like talking to you guys. I love when you leave little compliments like, good video, and I think, Oh, how kind of them. What a what a lovely gesture of them to offer such such kind words onto me and, and write in my entire day. Um, so yeah, if you guys have time to do that, definitely do that and we can chat. Other than that, I will see you guys in the next video. Have a good night.